Right. How are we going to do this? Mrs. Bennett? No <laughs> okay. What what are we starting with Gavin's thing? The synodal way. The synod, sorry. Uh um, ex Anglicans, I mean. Are we uh, yes. Gavin, what are you doing? I, I'm I'm I, well I've got some mist on my uh, it's either the holy ho halo of holiness, but as we know it can't be that. I suspect <laughs> it's I just I suspect it's just guff. I, I was trying to clean my lens. Um Is it cold in your cathedral shed? Yeah, slightly, yeah. It's probably Jeez. it's probably <laughs> I'm get, I'm getting a wood banner in December, which is extremely exciting. Mm. Well, we'll uh, do a whole episode on that. Yes, that's right. Hello and welcome to Catholic Unscripted, episode nine. I'm Catherine Bennett. I'm Mark Lambert. And I'm Gavin Ashenden. We met this week, didn't we, with Father Michael Nazir Ali, who is just back from the from Bangkok, where he spoke to the Conference of Asian Bishops. And he was asked to speak about Christianity in the context of other faiths. But then at the last minute, I think the bishops asked him to speak about the Synod, uh, which he did. But then following that, um, he was, well, Austin Ivory um, was wrote a piece about him alarmed at the contribution of him and other ex-Anglicans uh, to the who, because they've spoken about the dangers of this synodal pathway. Uh, and then you responded to that, Gavin, by writing an article about your experience as an ex-Anglican. Do you want to tell us about that? Put very simply, um, Bishop Michael feels that he was lambasted improperly by the progressives because they were suggesting that he was so worked up with bitterness, particularly about the ordination of women. They, they're putting this idea that the, the, the recent Catholic, Catholic converts are all misogynists who fled into the Catholic Church because of the women issue. Ed Tomlinson wrote a really brilliant thing saying, <laughs> actually, it was Newman, the Church Fathers, the Catechism. We read up, we read very carefully before we came. And that's true of me and all the others. Of course it is. It's, it's, it's nonsense. But in order to, to push their narrative to destabilise and diminish what monsignor michael said they said you know his bile just ran over and he couldn't stop himself telling the asian bishops how dreadful the snodal path was to warn them but but so when we met him yesterday day before yesterday uh, he said to us actually i was asked to do this um they they want they know all about christ and the other religions what they don't know is the implications of the present uh, hermeneutic of rupture what's going on in the church so so i told them um and then then in the tablet there was a hit piece trying to make out as we said that michael's motives was bad and his grasp of the situation was bad so i tried to write a piece that suggested that his motives were good his grasp was good and actually what what we as anglicans the position that, that the ex-anglicans were in were not that we were consumed with some kind of bitterness and had fled as misogynistic uh, refugees into the catholic church but that what we'd done is had we'd had a very serious experience of the spirit of the age <laughs> of all the factors that lie behind the synodal consultation working in, in Anglicanism and the outcome that they had through a synodal process. And yes, of course, ours was uh, legislative more than it was deliberative, but it's quite deliberative. We never stopped talking and arguing and listening and debating. Um, and so this was a, the, 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 the accusation that we couldn't tell the difference. You know, we hadn't bothered to work out what the Catholic consultative process was before we came in was again extremely shallow and, and simply wrong um and so this has resulted in yet another riposte from the ivory camp saying um uh, making a point which which we need to deal with which is the argument that's been made by the left in my experience the last 10 years so whenever i've talked about cultural marxism some clever clogs and it's usually a clever clogs um somebody who who is well read in political philosophy uh, well read enough to be able to swap definitions of Marxism says how dare you talk about cultural Marxism Gramsci and the Frankfurt School weren't weren't doing classic Marxist Leninism it wasn't Marxism you idiots it was something else don't you dare suggest that this was classic Marxism because it isn't and we can prove it to which the answer is yes you're absolutely right on those terms it's not classic Marxism 
But generic terms get used as umbrella terms to, die, to try and describe what, what things are more like than what they're unlike. So it's very like Marxism in the sense that it contains the same ultimate aims. A, a reconfigured society with, with power and resources uh, reconfigured and shared between different parties. So, OK, with Marx and Lenin, it was essentially about economics. It was a proletariat and the workers. But with Gramsci and the Frankfurt School, it was about cultural and ideological power. And it had to do with gender and identity. Um, so was it was it more alike or, or more different? Well, if you think it's more alike, it's a form of Marxism. So to come and say that what we're and, and, and why is why is what we're dealing with now a form of Marxism? B because what's happened is that people have um, Christ religious people are utopians by definition. We all want some. We know there's something wrong and we want something better. And the question is, what does this better look like? So within the Bible and within tradition, within the catechism, the better is essentially apocalyptic. <clears throat> it, it's. God is God is going to do something at the end, which will sort everything out. And our business is to keep faith and to mirror that as much as we can until he does it. But the but the secular utopians lose patience with God doing it. And what essentially they buy into a program that does it now. And so what the Snowdal, it, it's a very neat distinction and it's not necessarily all that easy to make. And what the Snowdal path has done is to look at this redistribution of power and above all sexual identity. So let's let this is what we want. This is how to get to the utopia that God wants us to be to, to get to. The problem is that the categories that they've chosen to do it in are categories of unholiness. So in the end, this becomes an argument about holiness and unholiness. Ultimately, the category, does God make us in our in, in, in his image? Do we make him in our image? Our argument with the synodal path is that the proponents are trying to make God in their image. They want people to be sexually and romantically happy. Uh, they want society to be to have a kind of uh, uns uh, um, inarticulated equality, um, but there's nowhere in the tradition where we're invited to be happy or equal. That's not part of the kingdom of heaven. So that's part of our argument for saying you've bought into a form of secular utopianism. The main engine is, is Marxist. That's where it began. That still colours it, and you've made a mistake in the category error. So to finish now. When, when Ivory comes back and says, Ashenden, you're an idiot, you don't know what Marxism is. I usually preface it with something like quasi-Marxism or cultural Marxism or, or neo-Marxism or religious Marxism. Some kind of adjective that says, I do know, I do have half a dozen different, different definitions of Marxism. But if we, unless we use this word, we don't understand why it's different from classical Christianity. I th I, you know, to be honest, I think we can probably do even better than that or make it even clearer to our viewers than that if we explain uh, the fundamental thing from reading your piece which I've got open in front of me here um at the time was that struck me about it um was that Marxism is about introducing isn't it or, or like and please tell me where I'm going if I'm going wrong here but the way I understand it is that it's about revolution so you've got the first thing that you have to do is set up a division between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie in the, the in the socio-economic schema of Marxism. But you can see that, that there's exactly that parallel being done in the synodal path. And, you know, you if you recall the, the cartoony thing that the synod secretariat released, which was a broken rope over the church with liturgy and scripture and all the you know what we always thought were good things on the bad side and lgbt and all this old rubbish on the other side so it, so it seems very i mean i think it's a brilliant analogy to say it's that there's a form of marxism because it's like adopting that so and you know the idea of the omicron the idea of time being cyclical from ancient times and the the break from that in the scripture is that you've got a starting point and an end point like you say a, a apocalyptic um and that's what we sort of stick to but they're sort of trying to bring it back to that hegelian dialectic of constant cyclical um you know breaking down and but and what marx did was he took that hegelian dialectic and added violence didn't he He added violent revolution as the catalyst that would change society and that was the way that society developed and this is what is it me that seems exactly what what's going on 
And, it's you true. Know, it's... Let's, let's expose another trick that they use. So one of the great driving forces behind the justification for the Snowdell way is the excluded. Mm. So it says, you know, the great thing the church has to do is to listen to and make contact with the excluded, the marginalized, the refugees, it even the loses. proletariat. <laughs> exactly. They're, that's exact. They are the new in this particular they're the form. That's pro they're the new proletariat. That's yeah. right. And, and why? Because they're using the Marxist concept of alienation. Alienation. Mm. Now, actually, as with all heresies, there's a good deal of truth in this. The human condition suffers very profoundly from alienation. Original sin is the form of, of alienation. But what does God say? He'll do. How will God deal with original sin? He does it by sending his son to die upon the cross so that so that the alienation is replaced by a form of in, a forgiven intimacy. You don't get that solution in the Marxist theological documentation that's being presented to us here. What you get instead is bring the refugees in, give the refugees a voice, let the refugees tell us. Essentially, it, it even says, go to the non-Christians and let them tell you what Christianity ought to be. This well, is so... and, and also kick out the trads, kick yes, out the Orthodox yes, Anglican. That's right. Yes. You know, let's have a revolution and get rid of them all. Yes, the trads are the new, the, the, the trads are the old landowners and, 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 and bourgeoisie. But 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 here's the problem: everyone knows that refugees are a protected a protected group in in the Old Testament. If the refugees come, well, you leave enough excess food for them. You, you, out of the excess of your of of your own society, you you act generously. The trouble is, it's contextual. Um, that's exactly what you're supposed to do with a few vulnerable refugees. But in the present context, giving a priority to the refugees buys right into a new world order in which national barriers are down, immigration is used as a tool of revolution and a redistribution of power. Uh, and this is all done um, as if it was a co a in continuity with the way in which the people of God are supposed to deal with the rootless in the Old Testament. It just isn't the same. The context is completely different. But by using so what what the what the progressives do is they take buzzwords the conservatives act well to. So the the word that the one they use always is in, in prayer. Mm. So Austin Ivory says, oh, all the people, all the progressives I know are, are deeply orthodox in faith and they pray a lot. Well, I'd like to know how they manage to pray a lot, because frankly, I find prayer one of the most difficult things in my whole life. Every single day I have to fight with the old Adam, the flesh, the broken man, the rebel in me, um, the, the, the person who wants to do what he wants to get on my knees and recite the Psalms. I'd love to know how these people pray with such ease and such regularity and to know they're praying in the spirit, because for the whole of my life, it's been the most tremendous struggle. But I, I frankly, I don't think they are because because, you know, everyone I know who prays has really prays, shares the same experience as I do. I know you both will do as well. I just I just know it because I know you both pray and this is what it is to pray. It's a huge struggle. So they use prayer. They use the word the Holy Spirit. They use mm. the word love a lot and compassion and refugee and excluded. And they use all the buzzwords to make people feel that they are, in fact, in the center of what the faith represents. But they're not. It's a trick. It, it, it's a delusion. In the end, the, the, these words are used to point us in entirely a different direction. Mm. Father Gerald Murray wrote recently, all this talk about listening to the Holy Spirit, who remarkably is speaking through the complaints and criticisms of those who reject what the church teaches and has always taught. So I think this you're quite right. There's, there's a it's also this conflation of power with authority or this misunderstanding of power and authority. So the church speaks with authority. But when you ask people what, you know, how the church is structured, they say the person with the most power is the pope. And then there's the cardinals and then there's the bishop. But what do they mean by that? So when, when it's understood in that way, then perhaps it is problematic. But it's about right teaching. It's about it's about having that authority from Christ. It's not about an, an oppressive, you know, trying to oppress people. And the way that the synod is is working out is that bishops are functioning as recording secretaries. They're not they're not actually speaking with authority, but they're they're recording these these voices coming from the listening project. So that isn't that's never been my understanding of how the authority of the church functions. The bishops ought to be the articulators of the apostolic faith. Mm. The fact they've been reduced to, to bureaucratic secretaries mm. ought to worry us. And you're right. Again, the real test is 
Is the natural language of the process power or holiness? The natural process of this is power. We're saying it should be holiness. When the Snowdle path is a cons consultation about holiness, I'll be all in. Mm. But for as long as it's about power, I'm all out. I've got other things to do than to try and could, could express the, ter the church in progressive sociological terms, which is what this is doing. Mm. So uh, to put a good spin on it, perhaps. What? <laughs> Hang on, Mark. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> um, Not ready for this. I had a chat with an uh, Australian friend of mine, Scott Smith, who's a bit of a theologian and he's a big sort of defender of Pope Francis like he he sort of is very honest he he spends a lot of time criticizing the, the progressives if you know what I mean but at the same time he does seem to have a a, a real insight into the map the mind of the man and so his suggestion we were chatting this week um which I always find like of great benefit to talk to him and he was he pointed me towards um Querida Amazonia, you know, I don't know if you remember, that was the bizarre, bizarre it seemed to me, bizarrely named document after the Amazonian Synod, which was, you know, again, was another exercise in throwing all kinds of wacky ideas out there. They had that mad German bishop who'd lived in the Amazon for 30 years and never baptised anyone. Never baptised anyone, anyone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And he was there with his girlfriend or whatever, and, you know, all kinds of madness going on. And yet, when Corrado Amazonia came out, I, I mean, you can look up my blog. It's good news. There's nothing wacky in the, in the apostolic exhortation because Francis didn't say, he didn't endorse any of those mad ideas. And one of the things that they say about him is um, that he's, he's much more conservative. I remember what, there was a cardinal, I can't remember if I've told you this story or not, who was interviewed right at the beginning when he was first appointed. I wish I'd kept a note of who it was, but he basically said um, he indicates left and turns right and he will upset everyone. He won't make the conservatives or the progressives happy. You know, he will just make a God awful mess of it. And that's really, you know, precisely what he's done. And so basically the idea is that what that's what he likes this sort of, he likes to go out and he's, the way Scott said was that he was looking for an echo of his own thought and that this is what has worked with the, the Jesuit community that he was in charge of was that he, he'd sort of have a listening exercise and he'd hear back what he expected to hear back and then that would help him to make a decision. But the problem with um, the Amazonian Synod and well, all the synods that he's done, the Synod of the Family and this one, is that it weighs him back is what he wants to hear. So literally someone told me that with the Amazonian Synod, he had it all planned to do the, I think it was the married men mm. thing. And but the, the reaction, that he, the echo, if you like, that he heard back stopped him from doing it because he genuinely believes that that is the Holy Spirit speaking to him. So I, I think, this, you know, if that is the case, then you could say that the same thing, exactly the same thing is going on here, that he's throwing out all these wacky ideas and I think what he's expecting is if there's no pushback, then that's the Holy Spirit pointing him in that direction. But complete, completely the opposite is happening and it's just absolute bedlam, you know, everyone going crazy about it all. So I, I just hope that that is, that there is, that I mean, you know, it's very difficult to, to see what good is actually coming of it. And I, I think especially because the people who translate for him are these people that we're talking about who seem to be, they seem to have their own idea of what's going on and where it's going, and they are manipulating the process. And again, that is something we've seen in the synodal process time and time again. There was, uh, in the first one, I think, George Pell, Cardinal Pell, stood up and banged his fist on the table and said, will you stop trying to manipulate this synod process? So, you know, it's been going on from the beginning, people, are, and, you know, Cardinal Greg, what can you say? You put someone like that in charge, you know, he's a no. He's known to be a problem before he was promoted. So you're going to get all this. And he's been in Rome learning Vatican speak for years. So he knows how to do all the old guff, you know, that doesn't actually say anything, but sort of sounds like it. he might know what he's talking about. So, yeah, yeah I think we shouldn't be surprised in that respect. It's, it's the lack of clarity always that's the, the difficulty, because, yes, we know the Holy Spirit's in charge ultimately, but um, when you have Gret 
responding to some of the questions that he's had and you listen to the responses, there's, you can't get anything from it. There's no clear answer. There's no answer to the question that's been asked. You can get nothing. And so then you think, well, what then the people on the ground, the lay Catholics who are doing catechesis and uh, formation are then being presented with this and, and the, there's no clarity. So that's the difficulty. Yes, the Holy Spirit's in charge. Yes, uh, the gates of hell shall not prevail. But it it, it's, it makes it more difficult for for you know ordinary ordinary lay Catholics. I think we should say that if Mark is right, it's very encouraging. Um, I mean, while you were talking, I've been applying your diagnosis to the situation, and I must say, I think it fits quite well. This idea that Francis indicates left and then goes right. There have been this, a couple of times when um, he's uh, he's slapped the German synod, uh, the German synod down, mm. for example. Uh, he's reiterated that there won't be gay marriage and specifically said so, um, and annoyed people, but. Uh, it's very hard to re reconcile that with all the signalling going left. Mm. If, if, as Mark says, this is part of the process by which he discerns the Holy Spirit, then one can understand it. The trouble is the cost is just enormously high because the ambi okay. you know, the atmosphere of ambiguity that, that, that is created uh, is, prof is really, I, I know the word is overused, but it's really very toxic when it comes to the mm. faith that holds the church together. Because what it does is it, ex it, it excites and encourages the people on the left who are sub-Catholic and even sub-Christian uh, to think that they have papal backing and they're going to win. And so they go all out. And it entirely demoralizes the people on the right, who I would say are really are, are seriously interested in holiness rather than politics, uh, which is, the, you know, in religious terms, is a difference, as I understand it in the terms I mean it, between the left and the right. So Mark could very well be right. It would also explain why Anne Whittacombe is so confident that, that for all the talk and the hot air, she says, they can't change anything. The, you know, the integrity of the magisterium means he can't turn left. He can only turn right, because that's what it is to be a Catholic, in the sense that it's got to be congruous and contiguous with the past. So, Mark, I hope you're right. Um, it will, that, that will mean when we get to the end that that will be encouraging. So, good. One of, I think one of the most interesting things about this cabal, if you like, of people on the, the sort of more progressive wing of the church is that is their desire to other people like this week. We've seen them do with the mm, end. Yeah. And that, that, you know, that's what Austin's done that on. There's another article. I'm, I'll, I'll send you the links, Catherine. You can put them on the, the show notes. But they, he did another one about the Polish church. When the Polish cardinals said something against Pope Francis, Austin published a piece saying how rubbish the Polish church were, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the things that I've always loved, and I think I've spoken about it on numerous episodes now, is the breadth of our church. It seems to me that being a Catholic is about what is about all the world, unity and diversity, I think is the term that I like to sort of use. You know, it's all of us together and that you can go anywhere in the world, you can go to Mass in Africa or in India, or, you know, we're at Italy, wherever you go in the world, and it's the mass, the mass is the mass, and you're with brothers and sisters, and you feel part of that, and there might be cultural differences or whatever, but you still feel part of that, mm. that you, that's your family, you know, and that is one of the most wonderful things about being a Catholic, um, and I'd encourage anyone, you know, if you're on holiday, always find your church, I've been to, you know, church, I've been to mass in Greece, and Italy, and you know all over the world and it's it's such a wonderful experience and these guys they want to kick people out of the church that seems to be all their they want to ring fence what it means to be catholic and that's isn't this what pope francis seems to do a lot you know he spends a lot of his time there's a, one of my friends lawrence england who used to be a blogger i think he's sort of given up blogging now has done a, he's done a little website you can look it up called pope francis bumper book of insults <laughs> it's just got all the quotes that from, you know, all the, the all things that he's called people over the years. And Francis tends to do that. If you do this, if you've got this sort of face, if you look left, you know, if you look up in the sky or you wear the wrong kind of shoes, you're not a Catholic. It's one of the things that he constantly says that I find at, like antithetical to Catholicism because we're about bring, you know, like we're talking about big tent Catholicism last week weren't we and that, I, I think I do believe in big tent Catholicism but it's not doctrinal you know it's not <laughs> dogma we all believe in the creed we have to have a common belief and then our expression of it or 
because people like different things, don't they? You know, and people are on different phases of their journey. And, but, you know, and I think that's fine as long as we're all coming to Christ. And that's what that's the key point. So I, I, that that is another telltale sign for me that there's a serious problem with these guys is their desperation to other anyone who doesn't agree with them and kick them out of the church, you know? Yeah. Where do we go now? Okay. <laughs> well, we've done, yeah. we've done 41 minutes, 42 minutes. So maybe, maybe, well, we haven't, yeah, but some, haven't we? Oh no, no it's 42 since we, we started. We didn't sorry. start until, yeah, yeah. until no, about no, quarter past four. So done about 25 minutes, but. Well, we I, could move it. We could do the, do you want to do the Haglia thing? So, Christopher, so one of these guys, Christopher Lamb, did you, I don't know if you read it, it was in the tablet. I mean, he, he's tweeted a load of it, so you can read pretty much all of it just on Twitter. But he basically went and did an interview um, with Archbishop Paglia. So who is, you know who he is, don't you? He is the head of the uh, Pontifical Academy for Life. You know the Pontifical Academy yeah. for Life, the one that for us is <laughs> sacked all the people who believe in life and employed <laughs> all the people who believe in death. Archbishop Paglia is most famous for having a picture, a homoerotic mural oh, yeah. painted on his cathedral <laughs> wall and with, with himself in it, complete with Zuchetta, you know, bare bottoms and all this sort of thing. Like the bloke has obviously got massive problems. So, you know, probably the best thing to do is put him in charge of this Pontifical Academy of Life. So <laughs> after Mazakuta, you know, this Amer Italian-American pro-abortion atheist, was appointed um they're obviously doing a bit of a rehabilitation piece and quick ring up christopher lamb he'll do whatever we tell him and he's gone round to paglia's house and done an interview with him i say interview it's basically a complete whitewash of why vincent paglia is the best guy in the world to be running the pontifical academy of life why it's really important that we have pro-abortion atheists on the panel uh, and by the way he also completely passes the buck and says it was all Francis's fault um, and then he sort of explains she's not pro-abortion she's pro-choice apparently um, which is, <laughs> is a massively important differentiation to make and um, basically the whole thing is just a, a really good laugh if you want a really good laugh <laughs> of how and an example of how not to be a journalist and how not to ask questions and or hold anyone to account about anything read that bit by Christopher <laughs> Land. It's awesome. <laughs> Any comments on that? <laughs> uh, I'm going to read. Well, I just, I love the way they, they, they changed the reference so that um, she's there not for her views on abortion, but for her particularly skilled views on some entirely different esoteric <laughs> area of knowledge, as if her views on abortion shouldn't be talked about and, and weren't part of it. Well, in one sense, you could, you, you know, it's an argument. You can say she's been brought here for this skill. But it's pretty naff in Catholic terms to say uh, we're going to entirely ignore the fact that she's on the on the murderous wing of, a, of one of the more serious ethical conundrums we're dealing with and pretend that that has no influence or no or no significance or we can deal with it or just completely ignore it. I mean, I think this it's it's really it's immature and it's a There's no supernatural dimension to that thought process if that is genuinely i don't believe for a second it is what they thought but i think they're trying to manipulate you know i think they are genuinely trying to change church teaching on uh, contraception and uh, which i just can't believe it's going on but we have got what our lady said at fatima which was that the you know the fight would be over marriage and the family so yeah. here, here it is taking place in rome you know um but i, I like i think the fact that it's such an insult to catholic women well there's no catholic women who are clever enough to, about these issues you know that we have to haul in an, abo an abortionist and the other thing about it is that if she's like you know if we believe what the church teaches that's more that's a mortal sin we've got a duty to explain to her why it's a mortal sin not to bring mm -hmm. her into the tent and i don't know it just doesn't make any sense to me it's all madness isn't it yeah sure is all right, I thought it was a good topic. <laughs> I'll get me coat. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a very good topic, but yeah, and you you know so much more than than Catherine and I do about it. That we, all we can do is say, yeah, "You go, Mark." That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, Nothing sorry. else to add. It's, it's you know you summed it up beautifully. Okay.
Right. But they were, well, I suppose the only other thing we could talk about was what we were saying earlier about the modernists. Here we go, Gavin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go. <laughs> Carry on. Carry on. Well, no, Come just up. that, uh, you know, when we were saying, what are these people, you know, what are these people, where does it come from? Where do these things come from? And, um, you know, I was saying that uh, the encyclical Humano Generis actually identifies it. It's paragraphs 13 and 14 have got, it actually speaks to people who are, you know, doing this massive damage in the church by, and you can see that it's, it's out of a desire to water down theology, water down doctrine to make it more, uh, you know, so people who hear it in the mod from a, with a modern ear, if you like, it doesn't sound so radical or, difficult to understand so it's like a lack of faith in what the church actually teaches and instead of having that sort of docile acceptance that we were talking about earlier that you know sometimes you don't understand something but you just you you recognize that the church has thought longer and harder and deeper about mm. these things and has got divine revelation on its side so you you say lord please help me to understand this difficult teaching better because you want it to tra transform your life. And instead, these people are trying to transform the teaching of the church so that it fits with with their understanding of life in their three score years and 10, which, you know, sort of doesn't make any sense at all to me. Well, I'd like to put it in a, in a, in a context. And I think particularly if there are non-Catholics listening, it might be helpful to them. And one of the things we find in the Old Testament and even in the Gospels too, there's always a current of people who don't understand and want to change things. So the people of Israel complain to the prophets and say, you've got it wrong. I mean, they even throw poor Jeremiah down a, a public latrine to shut him up because he's saying, you've got to change your own ways and repent. You've gone off in the wrong direction. And when it comes to the Gospels, the same pattern continues. Even the disciples get it wrong. Uh, you know, they, they be, they're very close to our Lord. They're with him. How can they get it? How can they get it so wrong? How, how can the how can the sons of thunder say, Lord, nuke the village? Um, well, well but so it, all of this is put in as a warning to all of us that it's very easy to have all kinds of good instincts in our relationship with God, but to retain to ourselves in areas that matter to us a degree of independent uh, independence, which is not consistent with with the whole teaching of God. And one of the reasons I'm very glad to be a Catholic was I discovered as a Protestant that I was I was stuck in that as a permanent attitude. One of the things Protestants permanently do is to say. The organic church that Jesus founded is so constitutionally wrong that we're going to simply reject on principle what it stands for. What happens when you begin to suspect you, you ought to be a Catholic is that you, first of all, stop misrepresenting what the church says. That's the, the most important thing. And then you compare it with what the Protestant church says. And you also you compare the outcomes. Um, and, and it gets enormously exciting to say, because obviously the question is, Lord, am I one of these people who's reserving to myself an area of life that I'm not going to let you reconfigure? So for me, when I was a liberal for 15 years, it was the LGBT stuff. The reason I understand the actually people coming is I decided that, that compassion was more important than holiness. And I mean, I even said so. I knew, I knew what I was doing, uh, but I was so concerned that the, that the God I was speaking to was more compassion than he was holiness. I lost the plot. Um, but the great thing about being a Catholic is in the catechism, what the church has done is it's mulled for 2000 years. It's mulled over what holiness is. It's mulled over what liturgy is. Mm. And, and therefore, by being a faithful Catholic, you can have some reasonable confidence. You're in the center of God's will because the, the church, the whole church of all the cultures through 20th centuries has engaged in this enormously powerful act of discernment. And one of the reasons why. Anglican converts get so cross with the progressives is they're completely chucking it all out as if the discernment has never been there to bring back in a new form of division which says we know better than the church we know better than God we prefer something else other than obedience and holiness well it might be social justice it might be compassion it might be inclusion it might be sexual freedom it might be my own personal integrity it doesn't matter what it is it's always something other than compassion and holiness someone was talking to me about an, another issue which i won't i won't get on a rabbit hole with and i was saying that I, I would like to to take the freedom to make this choice that was being urged on me but actually i was so impressed about an encounter between the children and our lady at garabondal 
And the bishop there made a really bad error. And he said, you know, he forbade the children to meet Our Lady in the church in order to stop these pesky children making claims about Our Lady. He said, you, you don't let the children in church. So the children had an encounter with Our Lady outside the church. And, uh, and they complained to her and said, you, you know, isn't he silly? Shall we meet in the church? And, and she said, no, what, what the father wants from you is humility and obedience more than the privilege of meeting in the church. I think that's so important. And it's, it's one of the things that's driven me both to become a Catholic and, and to remain this kind of Catholic. There are all kinds of things I would like to do or prefer, but humility and obedience ought to be the bedrock upon which everything is built. And when you apply that to the progressives, that, that isn't their priority. They, they fail on that. I know I'm close to failing on it because it demands a really high price. But I think probably it may be one of the theological and spiritual criteria that give us the confidence to say that by 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 believing in the catechism by believing in the gospels by believing in the magisterium we are actually the right kind of catholics <laughs> loving god in the right kind of way because if that's not true then it's chaos and anarchy who knows it's all relativism but i think it is true well, that's brilliantly put gavin and that uh, that is exactly my experience i when I was younger as a Catholic, I thought I had, it was all about change and new ideas. And as I grew older, I, I realised that all I needed to do really was to go to Mass, receive the sacraments and draw closer to Jesus, read my Bible. And, yeah. that, and that's all, that's my, all right, we talk about all this stuff and I've studied all this stuff and I've talked, you know, we talk about, we have to talk about the ideas that are going on, the, the movements in the church and stuff. But pers my personal spirituality, and I think the three of us share that, would you agree, is that we're trying to draw closer to Jesus all the time. And that's yes. what the church is for, Catherine, isn't it? That's what you were saying, you know, that that's what the church exists for. Yeah, I think that's the key question behind all of it is what does the church exist for? Um, and if we can get to the root of that, if we can answer that, then I think we can assent. Um, and also on this idea of the, the difficulty of following the faith and not always understanding it. The other thing is, so then you just do it and then when you do it you you find your life is transformed you find you find that you understand why the church teaches what it does because of how it has transformed your life because it, of how it's ch changed you and in a way that you didn't expect that you wouldn't have rationally been able to come to that conclusion yourself and this is the as you say this 2000 year history of of church teaching it's not out of nowhere and it's obviously Christ, it's the Holy Spirit working through the church and so we trust it and we trust it outside of our ability to rationalize it we just leap it's a leap of faith we leap and we say I, tr I trust this is true and then when you do well it's and part of the problem as well Mark we, we talked earlier about Gaudium et Spes uh, 16 which opens up this is always a problem which opens up this idea of conscience this misunderstanding of conscience um, as just this little voice of you being able to say that trumps everything I'll do whatever I want because I, I feel this is right. And even the church teaches that this is this is the, the final word. But that isn't, I think that's been a bit of a, a misinterpretation or a danger that has opened up a lot of what we're seeing now is this appeal to conscience as trumping all, but not seeing conscience as uh, rightly formed and always in line when it's rightly formed with the constant teaching of the church. Um, you know, that's very interesting. That's, that's, that helps so much because um, what Michael Azza Ali was saying was don't consult people who've not been catechized about mm -hmm. the faith. They've not been rightly formed. Mm -hmm. And I love the idea because I've always been very suspicious of my conscience. I don't think it's very well formed. I don't really trust my conscience to tell you the truth. I've never trusted it. And you may say that, well, you know, how, <laughs> what an immoral person you are. But what I think I mean by it is I'm so aware of the capacity for self-deception. Uh, and uh, goodness knows how many times I've been deceived in my life. But, but you know, that's what the demons do. The, the demons set out to uh, to intensify self-deception. And once again, you can only really know you've been deceived by being accountable to other people. Uh, and so, for example, I think one of the reasons why the three of us are doing this together is because we're accountable to each other. We're also accountable to the church. It's a very dangerous and if I may say so, a kind of Protestant and, and, and souped up existentialist idea that your conscience is somehow so well formed, so in tune with the Holy Spirit, so pure, so good, so clever, that all you need to do is refer to it and bingo, you've got the answer. I know it doesn't apply to me. It's a bit like prayer. 
I'm not altogether sure I trust people who say they can pray easily and they, they know how to do it. I don't really trust people who say my conscience is very well attuned. I'm going to give it priority. Mm. That's a wrap, people. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thanks for watching. I'm Catherine Bennett. I'm Mark Lambert. I'm still Gavin Ashenden. Thank you very much for your mm. patience. God bless you. Keep on, keep on, please, uh, commenting, uh, subscribing, and and above all, send this, say a prayer, and send this to a couple of your friends. Mm.